Hey everyone, welcome to WebSleuth's YouTube Live. My name is Tricia Griffith, the very proud owner of WebSleuth.com, and I am so thrilled to have with us one, one of our favorite people, uh, death investigator and host of the uh, mega podcast, Body Bags, Joseph Scott Morgan. Sir, thank you for taking the time to join us today. I, I know you've been all over the place, uh, taking everybody's questions about Delphi, and I really appreciate you taking the time out for us. No, yeah, no worries. Y'all are some of my favorite folks. So ah, thank uh, you. I love joining you guys. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, tell us how, how have you been? What's new with you? Let's let's get a little a little warmth in your life going here and, and, and let us find out how things are with you. Well, I think, uh, let's see, uh, in the last 24 hours, I've been up since three o'clock in oh, the morning. No. So <laughs> oh. uh, it's, it seems like that that's normally the course of things for me. Uh, you know, I just uh, I stay on top of it, try to stay, mm -hmm. you know, uh, try to, you know, stay on top of everything that I do. Because the way I look at it, and I think that it's, it's uh, this way in every aspect of life, you have to look at every opportunity that you have, uh, regardless of how tired or fatigued you are, uh, and understand that it's just uh, another opportunity to sharpen your skills and to become better and better at what you do and learn from your mistakes. You learn more from failures than you ever do from successes. So, um, you know, well, I, right, I can... right now I'm, I'm kind of hitting, you know, you, you, you just drive on and doing a, a weekly podcast and, uh, we're talking about going to two episodes per week and uh, and a couple of added little extras. And so I do all of my own research and I try to do cases that are currently in the news mm -hmm. uh, that are not um, stuff that people have done over and over again. Um, I think as a matter of fact, I think today I recorded two weeks ago, actually, the case out of Oklahoma where the four guys in the river that had been oh, dismembered. Wow. Right. And so, yeah. So, you know, I just try to, I try to stay, stay current because there's always something to learn uh, relative to forensics and all of these cases. And I try to stay in my lane. So that's, that's, uh, that's what I do. Well, we love, we love your lane. So <laughs> Body Bags, uh, your podcast, uh, it's shooting up the charts, if I'm not mistaken. It, 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 it uh, you know, it ebbs and flows. Uh, we I had an interesting little bit of, of, uh, of news that came the other day, and I'm not quite tech savvy enough to understand it, but, you know, we're platformed with iHeart. Right. And so iHeart promised us between, let's see, let me get my date straight. I think from the 28th of October through the week after Thanksgiving, they're going to, we're going to have 2.5 million impressions for body bags oh. over that period of time where, you know, I, I voice, I voice my own little ads that I do. And you hear these in all the podcasts. Anyway, they're going to be dropping those into podcasts along the way and doing all of that. And of course I do, I do my work. I'm in my third season with the Piketon Massacre right now too, which very excited about, um, particularly, you know, considering that that's, that's at trial now. Right. And that's been, uh, with my friends with KT studios, that's been kind of a, a labor of love, mm -hmm. uh, for me. Uh, I love working on those guys and we did the Doherty gang together, which I was one of the producers of. And that soon from my understanding, the movie is finally going to come out relative to the Doherty gang. So I'm very excited about that. Oh, and wonderful. it's going to be at South by Southwest. I mean, what's it called? South by Southwest or South, whatever it is, the thing in Austin. Yeah. The, uh, the, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. So okay. we're, we're excited about that. So a lot of, a lot of things popping on the horizon, other things I can tell you guys about soon, hopefully. So it's a film festival in Austin, right? Yeah. yeah. And oh, one other thing. I am traveling to Greenville, South Carolina, the week after uh, a week from this upcoming Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, Oxygen actually heard my episode on body bags about the Suttles homicide, mm -hmm. which um, was at the hands. Some of the uh, some of your followers may be familiar with the Prince uh serial killer i think he killed like four or five women 
mm-hmm. in North Carolina, South Carolina. Anyway, I'm going to be traveling over to uh, to Greenville a week from this Saturday and filming an episode of Buried in My Backyard for Oxygen oh, on, the right. subtle, on the Suttles case. So I'm very mm-hmm. excited about that. That was a labor of love. Uh, that poor woman, um, you know, the, what she endured and what all of those, those ladies endured at the hands of this monster. And I'm glad he's off of the streets. Now. Right. Well, we'll definitely look forward to that. That will be, uh, again, another amazing project coming from Joseph Scott Morgan. You have so much going on. And again, we appreciate you taking the time out mm-hmm. to talk to us because we have so many questions about Delphi and uh, Abby and Libby and everything that is going on. Um, Let's just kind of give a quick overview of the latest. Um, A guy named Richard Allen was arrested. Um, It appears that uh, he is the suspect bridge guy, as we call him. Uh, He was right there in town. Uh, He gave, uh, you know, he, he, he was a pharmacist, uh, not a pharmacist. He was a pharmacist. He was a technician. And he also did uh, photo. He uh, did photographs for the family. He would actually, you know, tell the family, Hey, I'm not going to charge her for these because they were putting pictures together for Libby's funeral. And so he was like, he was had his fingers in that family that way. Mm-hmm. And um, apparently, and, and this is my theory and it's a lot of people's theory is that uh, this, um, Kagan Klein character and this this shots profile on on um, social media. I, I think they're all connected. I think the Klein, I think uh, Kagan and Tony and uh, and Richard Allen. I think they are all connected. Uh, I think this was probably done <clears throat> as a way to um, sell perhaps pictures or or film on the dark web. Uh, I think it's going to expand out more and we're going to see more people connected to this. And uh, I think it's going to be absolutely horrific. So from what we know so Mm -hmm. far, and again, a a lot of this is just conjecture and uh, what, what people, people are saying, but it seems that this is not so much, a serial killer or a killer of children as he was doing it for some other reason. Like I said, for uh, pornography or for filming or for pictures. I, I What is your theory and, and what have you heard? Well, I, I kind of list toward, toward what you were saying about the connectivity and, uh, you know, um, with this Keegan fellow uh, who's currently, you know, cool in his heels. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I've got a, I've got a couple of reasons for that, you know, because you go back to this, this contact that he allegedly had with the girls and mm-hmm. it zeroed in on a specific time, a meeting time. He was supposed um, to meet them that day. Yeah. And that, you know, that's troubling, uh, because, you know, in, in my world as a former investigator and, uh, teach investigators. There are no coincidences most of the mm-hmm. time. If they are, it's, you know, it's, you'll have those moments in time where, you know, it kind of eludes your logical sensibilities, but mm-hmm. most of the time, what you see is what you get. And so I, I think that, um, there could potentially be connectivity. It's also come to my attention that this fellow that they hooked up on charges on Friday had also resided at one point in time in Peru, Indiana, mm-hmm. which is where, uh, this fellow Keegan, whatever, right. uh, had, I think that's where they hooked him up initially mm-hmm. where he was residing with his father. Yes. Uh, he also resided the, uh, this fellow from the pharmacy also resided in Mexico, uh, Mexico, Indiana as well. And mm-hmm. so it's not that, it's not that far away. And, you know, gone are the days, if you've ever seen the movie Hardcore that came out back in the, uh, back in the seven, yeah. yeah, with George C. Scott. George C. And then, Scott. of course, they, great movie. yeah, it really was. And they tried to do a remake of it with eight millimeter with Nicolas Cage. It's kind right. of loosely based. The days are gone of, you know, guys meeting out in dark alleys and under bridges mm-hmm. to exchange hard copies of things. They're networked 
wildly networked. And I kind of picked up on something during that that uh, that news conference, and I made comment about this last night on Court TV. And I don't really think I realized what I said until I said it. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, you're kind of sitting there, and you're you know, you're and this just kind of popped in my mind. You know, when the superintendent gave his statement, he he said something twice during during his comments that mm-hmm. were quite shocking, not shocking, kind of striking to me in little old Delphi, Indiana. He used the term global twice. And it seemed, and and listen, I understand. I've been dealing with this case since 17. You know, I know the Patties. Um, I know Mike Patty particularly. I I spend time with him at CrimeCon every year. I make Mm -hmm. it a point my wife and I have donated to the family to build a softball field, all these sorts of things. We've gotten pretty close. I mean, I wouldn't say that we're, you know, uh, we don't go out and dine together, but right. we, we talk, you know. And um, when I, I thought about them in Delphi and then I thought about what the superintendent said, and I, I know what Mike has said. He's gotten, you know, he's been contacted from all over the world for all these years, you know, people extending condolences and is there anything we can do and all that sort of thing. But it just seems strange to me that he said that. And I, I wonder if there's not some type of connectivity um, to a broader broader spectrum here. And I, I think, you know, there are a lot of players mm-hmm. from an investigative standpoint yeah. that are engaged in this. And mm-hmm. when you start looking at a very wide ranging network of people, I think that that's something that has to be taken into, uh, into consideration anytime, mm-hmm. uh, particularly you get up into the strata with, with the feds, uh, things slow to a crawl. Yeah. Uh, because if, if you've never dealt with the FBI, which, you know, I've, I've had occasion to deal with them many times working in the medical examiner's office over a course where they have agents killed or their agents kill somebody mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, there's a lot of information from the individual organizations that goes out to them. Mm-hmm. You rarely, if ever, get anything back. And it's at their pace if you do. And mm-hmm. so that can slow things down considerably. And in addition to that, I, I just know that the people at the state level and at the local level in Indiana have really been taking their time to try to put all the pieces together. Um, You look how small that place is, Mm -hmm. uh, the county, the county itself. And I look at what they're dealing with or have have had to deal with in Piketon. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's very easy to bespoil uh, the jury pool in those areas. And Mm -hmm. so it does not surprise me what happened yesterday. I, I could have predicted that these people play things very, very tightly. To the you mean the, it was there was a uh, hung jury? Is that correct? Well, no, there's not a hung jury there, but they they had speculated with Piketon, uh, mm-hmm. which is still ongoing. The first the first of those cases that it might have to be moved. Oh my! And oh, that's okay. you know it might as well be Pike County, you know Ohio might as well be in another state you right. know, when compared to Dayton or to. Cleveland or Cincinnati because it's in rural Appalachia, right Mm -hmm. adjacent to Kentucky. They didn't want it moved. And so you're dealing with kind of the same thing in Delphi. Mm -hmm. Uh, The more information that's released, listen, everybody's heard about it, but the more information that is released as well, I think the prosecutor is probably looking at this now because it's actively in his hands. We saw him appear on stage. I think that that's one of the considerations as well. We'll hear more. It'll be coming right. out in the next few weeks. So there you go. Um, I was just listening to uh, Gray Hughes, and he reported something that that I had assumed, but apparently uh, it has now been stated, and I, I can't find it, but I, I trust Gray. And that was basically that uh, Keegan <laughs> um, brought up Richard Allen's name when when they really? when they arrested him all of a sudden Richard Allen, and I hope I'm getting this right, I apologize if I'm not, but he's the one that brought up Richard Allen's name, which would lead people to believe, okay, he's cutting a deal, you know, he's trying to to cut a, a, a deal that's better for him. And again, it's just so odd that um, they reported that Keegan was waiting in a red Jeep, his father has a red Jeep, he was waiting for someone while 
the murders were taking place. And to me, that's just, you might as well just say it. He was waiting, waiting for Richard Allen. And uh, then shortly after that, Keegan and his father head to Vegas. Well, what's in Vegas? You know, it's not lollipops and sunshine. It's some pretty, you know, fun stuff, great stuff, and some real scary, dark things. And you have to wonder, was what happened there, was that taken to Vegas to try and sell? Again, was this supposed to be uh, just, you know, filming the, the girls and then it turned into to, to murder? It wasn't supposed to be. There's so many different, I'm sorry, I have a new puppy. And of course, he doesn't do anything until I start, you know, talking on the computer. But I just, I just feel like you said, I feel like it's all connected. These three are connected and it's just going to get bigger and bigger. And I, I'm sick to my stomach at what we're going to learn about what happened to Abby and Libby. I'm just sick to my stomach because they've talked about the posing. Uh, he took, the person took clothing. There were five signatures. There's no reason to do all of that. I think, think unless you're taking pictures or filming or something you know and yeah I've, I've had that thought in the back of my mind as well and the people have been throwing around the term staging and posing mm -hmm. posing is different than staging and so um it's it's you know when you think of staging most of the time and i've covered a couple of cases of staging on body bags where you stage a suicide to make you know to cover up a, a homicide uh contextually that's something that behaviors look at from a different perspective uh, posing posing is where it's a uh, it's a uh, it's in a, a necrophilic uh, context most right. of the time and it's where you have uh an inanimate and you pose them into lifelike uh, situations right. and those sorts of things. And it's, it's, it's calculated most of the time to document things or to re have a remembrance of, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to bring this name up, but Dahmer posed. A lot. You know, that was, that was one of the things that he did mm -hmm. that kind of went hand in hand with his behaviors and, right. and all of that sort of thing. Um, as far as evidence goes, um, I am assured that there is a, copious amount of evidence, mm -hmm. you know, that was uh, uh, documented at the scene. Uh, there will be uh, quite a bit of blood evidence. I think there's probably trace as well. We know we've heard a lot of comments about <clears throat> DNA. Mm -hmm. um, and to this point, I still I still don't know at this point. Uh, uh, if in fact um, what the sourcing of the DNA is, you know, because you can have it coming from multiple sources. Oh, sure. Right. Um, and so you don't really know the nature of that. I think that that's mm -hmm. one of those wait and see moments, but they do have it and they have um, firmly stated that on several occasions, you know, with either press releases or primarily uh, from the dais, you know, when they get up there, um, the, uh, you know, that's come out. I think that, that, uh, the families have, have stated, uh, mm -hmm. and it's documented that they've stated that they were informed by the police that there was DNA evidence that, that was compiled. I, I'm curious to find out if, if how, um, forensic genealogy has played into this. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, a genealogical profile was not developed in regards to this person that was arrested on Friday mm -hmm. uh, and how far out that extended and how long it took to work that lead uh, from the best of my understanding, at least at this point, he's not popping up really on anybody's radar as some type of offender. Right. It's not like he's been places and, and these types of things have happened before and people are looking at him now it's like, how did this, how did, how you're right. How did they find him? And is this his first time? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that is curious. I, I'd said from jump street that I felt as though it would be a local, you know, because Delphi is not someplace you wind up by accident. 
Mm-hmm. You have to be purposed. And I'm sure it's a lovely place. I have a lot of friends in the media that have been up there. Uh, and they've talked about, you know, the locals are, are scared. I, I heard one cool little anecdotal story I'd love to pass on to yes, you all please. from a friend of mine that was up there yesterday. Mm-hmm. And it was commented to this person, this dear friend of mine that was on the ground there. Uh, they wound up spending the night last night locally and kind of traveled around town. And they said that there was, um, a, they'd been up there several times and they interacted with the locals. And they said there was a palpable uh, kind of uh, relief, I think. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, and I found it very, very interesting that this occurred on Halloween um, and, or, you know, kind of preceded Halloween. And they, mm-hmm. They, this friend of mine had mentioned that um, several locals commented to them that how happy they were that their children were going to be able to experience Halloween because so many of these people had been living in fear. I mean, I, you know, and and when you're a parent, which, you know, a lot of us are, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and when we had little ones, there's enough fear in the world out there anyway. But when you have this level of horror in a community, you know, you don't feel like setting your babies loose, you know, to go collect candy at a stranger's house. It's dangerous right. enough as it is, but compiled with this. And there was kind of, I don't want to say it was jubilant, but I think that there was this kind of collective relief, you know, that mm-hmm. this guy is no longer among us, right. um, you know, in a physical sense right there. And so mm-hmm. that was something that I, I found I, it was, it, it gave me a, a bit of hope and an otherwise very, very sad set of mm-hmm. circumstances. Um, I'm going to bring an uh, insightful one up. She is our producer, and there are some questions in chat. Actually, people want to talk about Debbie Collier, so I hope uh, I hope we can ask you a few questions about that. Insightful one, welcome, my dear. Tell us about the question for Joseph Scott Morgan. Hello. Um, the one question from Charlie is, which I don't think we can answer till we know if it's homicide or suicide, is if right. she was staged or posed. But mm-hmm. yeah, that that's a great question, and I'm glad that you guys picked up on the staging or posing. Um, I, you know, I live not too far away in proximity from the location of that, or, and had lived up in that particular area of the state for some time before I moved to my present location. Uh, Haversham Sheriff's Office is not a, a big operation for those of you that are not familiar. Um, the GBI has gotten involved in this as well. Again, uh, the FBI. And I, I think that at this point, we're going to have to wait and see. There's a couple little points I'd like to make about Debbie Collier, and I'm glad mm-hmm. you brought it up. Um, I've said plainly on a couple of occasions relative to this case, I've worked maybe a total of three self-immolation cases that, you know, is, you know, essentially dumping gasoline on yourself and setting yourself on fire for the purposes of suicide. Mm -hmm. Okay. Most of the time when you have self-immolation and this goes to the cases I've worked in and my colleagues and stuff I've studied over the years, when there's a self-immolation, you will be covered in gasoline. Most of the time, these individuals tend to do it where they're going to empty the can. The problem is, with this case, it 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 has seemed to me at least to be focalized in one area, but I, they've waffled on this information they're releasing. Um, primarily, they've talked about abdominal burning, which is kind of an odd thing, you know, when you think about this. Why why would you put accelerant specifically in one focal area on your abdomen and ignite it? That's a question that I would have to have, that I would have to ask and have answered for me. Mm-hmm. And that's only going to be accomplished when, for me, when I can answer that question is after I read the autopsy report. Because this uh, Georgia football jersey that all of you guys have seen where she walks into the dollar store. Right. I understand that they found remnant of it that had been burned. Uh, in addition, I think that there was underwear or something like this and her Mm -hmm. body was partially clad um 
and it's and there's been some confusion as well relative to her precise distance from where she was eventually found and then the area where they had this kind of burned area and where the vehicle was parked along this roadway um which i find you know interesting as well because i have to try to understand the relationship i you know one of the first things i thought about when i heard about the fire and that she had i was thinking did this it was this like a flashover event where some accelerant was was splashed uh, mm -hmm. for some reason i've seen that happen where you'll have one particular area if, for any of you guys that have i hope none of you have but if you've ever seen anybody that was burned in a specific area generally that will happen if they're exposed to a blast of flame or if they get accelerant on them and that catches fire and they're kind of padding it out, stop, drop and roll, that sort of thing. And it will be limited to that area. Um, it, it's it just it seems odd. And I'm wondering if if accelerant hadn't, you know, ignited something on her and that the burn area is not actually the cause of death. It might be a contributing factor, um, but. I don't have enough information yet. And one of the things, just so we understand, one of the things that you look for, if you have a self-immolation case, uh, one of the things that you look for, there's two things you, you get at, at autopsy. First off, you're going to, in the lungs, um, you're going to look for particulate matter of, of uh, burned uh, items. And it can even be, I've seen people that have self, well, I've seen people that have been, on fire that have actually inhalated uh, their own uh, uh, body, if you will, for lack of a better term, where it burns off and they'll inhalate it. And you can pick that up on slides. But also, if there's any remnant of clothing, uh, you'll pick up on that as well. Uh, and um, you also look for color changes in the eyes. Mm -hmm. and on the surface of the lungs. Now, one of the things we do to bolster that is at autopsy in any kind of burn case that you have, just kind of file this away, any kind of burn case that you have, when they draw the toxicology and they draw the, the aorta blood uh, that we look for, um, specifically if we can get it, they're going to do what's called a carboxyhemoglobin level. And uh, what that does is it measures the amount of carbon monoxide that the individual had uh, had in an uptake event where they're inhalating like this when they're trying to catch their breath mm -hmm. and you have this debris that's coming up. Well, one of the products of the debris is carbon monoxide. Like you see, you know, somebody gasses herself in a car and the tissues will turn kind of a cherry pink. Now you say, Morgan, why is that important? Well, it's important because if they are inhalating, they're alive. That right. means that this wasn't an attempt to, destroy the body in a post-mortem sense where you have somebody that is being uh, someone's attempting to render down the body that we've seen in all of these cases over and over again. Um, and so that's going to be very important. I also find I, I never can make heads or tails out of this, this comment that they're constantly making um, about um, uh about clutching the sapling or yeah. it, it's been very, very nonspecific. So right now, you know, they have not released a lot of information and it's, it's, listen, I check, I check, I have a, a, a Collier, a Debbie Collier alert mm -hmm. <laughs> because I'm so interested in this case. Um, I have, you know, a Google alert set up specifically for it and man, it has just, uh, you know, gone down to a mere drops of information that'll come out. The last uh, article I think that came out was something from the Daily Beast, who I don't mm -hmm. necessarily uh, subscribe to, but it popped right. up and it was some kind of protestation that her son was making about the sheriff and that sort of thing. It had, there was no real, you know, uh, investigative value to it. So it's been, it's been very, very slow, you know, with this case. I, listen, I'm like you guys, I really expected that we would have known something by now. Um, and her body was taken to the state medical examiner's office, which is mm -hmm. in Decatur, Georgia. It's headquarters, uh, headquarters for the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. And the state 
uh, medical examiners located there. I was assigned there for about eight months as a liaison um, many years ago. And um, the laboratory, you know, people say we're waiting on tox results. The laboratory and the morgue are literally across the building from one another. There's mm -hmm. not a breakdown in communication at that level. Okay. So I think, I think that whoever is kind of holding sway over all of this is going to be is going to be, you know, law enforcement agencies that are involved. It's not the medical examiner holding this up, in my right. opinion, because they could turn that tox, those tox reports around pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And they're going to look, they'll do a standard panel on her to look and see what kind of medication she was on. And we look for standard things most of the time, uh, benzos and opiates and THC. And of course, we do blood alcohol, which is important as well. And there's a whole myriad of things that are kind of a standard panel. And since fire is involved, I can dollars to donuts. I bet you, you know, they did a carboxyhemoglobin level. Um, I'm, there's any number of ways you can go with this logically. Was it something that if it was at the hand of another, then was it so frenetic and rushed that they did a very poor job of trying to destroy evidence and destroy the body? But again, I have no measure for the level of destruction with the body because it's it hasn't plainly been stated um, at this point. So I'm like you guys, I'm kind of hanging back and waiting on this. The only thing that popped into my head was, okay, was it a, a suicide? Did she do this on purpose? Did she accidentally splash herself? Was somebody else involved? She didn't like the boyfriend, the, the daughter's boyfriend at all, you know, based on the old 911 calls and, and everything. Yep. Could she have been doing something to try and make it look like he was the one that uh, was doing this to her? I, you know, it just, I've, we had a case like this years and years ago in Utah uh, where uh, a woman tried to uh, make it look like her boyfriend murdered her when, in fact, it was suicide. And I thought, you know, could, could it be something as crazy as that? Because, Joseph, nothing makes sense in Debbie nope. Collier's case. Nothing. You know? No, it doesn't either. As a matter of fact, I see Kirby just made a comment. This might have been covered, but was she nude or not? I've heard both. Kirby, I've heard both as well. Right. So yeah. that gives you the level of lack of information that's coming out. So to your point, would she go to this go to this degree in order to make it appear like someone else had done something? Maybe. Uh, I hate to be you know, kind of milk toast about that. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's certainly right. something that, anything. yeah, it could, I mean, anything, you know, is still on the table. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the things that draws us to discuss these types of things, you know, because, um, you know, because it's, you know, it, it piques our interest relative to wanting to know, to try to determine information. Right. And it is a big puzzle. And I, you know, I, I don't know if you guys agree with me or not. If you don't, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't, out of all the cases kind of I've covered this year, um, uh, and here we are coming to the end of the year now, right? We're already in November. This might be the most bizarre. Uh, yeah, yeah. It really, it, if, if there was a bizarro, you know, award for the mm -hmm. end of the year. I think that this case out of little Habersham County, Georgia might, might fit the bill. Um, the fact that she, you know, that she went at such great distance. And if you're not from Georgia and understand this area where she was in, you know, she's domiciled in Athens and she drove past, literally drove past the area where she was eventually found and wound up on the road that literally for any of you guys that have been up through that beautiful area of the country where Georgia and North Carolina meet, it's lovely country. You're right in the Blue Ridge right there, um, heading into North Carolina. That's the road she was on. As a matter of fact, she was not that far away from the North Carolina border, um, you know, where she got to that store and then she turned around and she headed back southbound, you know, and uh, when uh, I got to interject what, you know, <laughs> what my wife uh, what my wife had said when she initially sounded like it, you know, when she initially heard this, this kind of her first blush, uh, she had said, uh, you know what, that daughter and that boyfriend had just moved out. She probably just wanted to get out of the house and, and go yard sailing. And the reason she said that is that up that road, as you're headed toward North Carolina, 
the road is dotted with like flea markets headed toward North Carolina because there's a lot of people like leafers and people want to go ride in the mountains. That's the route that you go to get up in that area. And, you know, maybe just to get out and clear your head. I mean, all of us have got interesting families, if you know what I mean. And mm -hmm. these two oh, yeah. show up on your these two show up on your doorstep. And maybe you just want to get out of the house and clear your head. Yeah, because they're a who, pile who, of who trouble. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they are. And, you know, and, you know, how many times have any of us wanted to hop in our car and, and, yeah. and head out? The strangest thing that I'd heard, I think, out of out of this case, mm -hmm. and this is not the gospel truth. This is just one of those things that was out there is the reason she was driving the van is that something fell off of a truck that was in front of her damaged her vehicle she had to get a, a rental vehicle which turned out to be the van and the person that was driving the vehicle which something fell off is a convicted felon and begged her not oh, to report right, it, to report it and right. so that that had come off as well right and you know and she had you know because he was on probation or something mm -hmm. like that i was never able to confirm that either so there's all kinds of wild things you know that float around with these cases uh, insightful one. Do we have any more questions in chat? I know people are making lots of comments. Right. So somebody had asked about her hand supposedly being around the tree. Mm -hmm. um, so they're asking if that would be staged or posed or would that be a normal thing somebody does if they're burning to death? Sorry. <laughs> no, that's OK. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's a fantastic question in the sense because I've thought about this because it's really odd. I've heard that her hand was caught. Then I've heard she was gripping. And those are two separate actions. And, you know, her her body was down and kind of down in an embankment. If you could see this countryside where she's in, this is not like perfect pasture land. You're not too far away from what's referred to as to, uh, Tallulah Gorge. If you don't know what Tallulah Gorge is, write that down and go look up the images of it. And you'll get an idea as to what the countryside is like around there. Um, it's, it's massive. It's not Grand Canyon massive. However, it is massive. You've got, you know, uh, a lot, it's a lot of hill country. It's really steep. You've got these real deep areas, you know, that you can kind of slip down into. When I first heart heard that, because it was such an odd thing to say, mm -hmm. she was gripping a, a, a sapling, her wrist was caught on a sapling. Again, this kind of narrative that gets spun out like this. I thought, well, did somebody deposit her body down there and her body was pushed over the side and she rolled and her hand kind of hung up in that manner and maybe it gave the appearance of gripping something. Again, I'd need to see a crime scene photograph in order to mm -hmm. understand because their idea of gripping and my idea of gripping might be completely different. So I would have to see it. I, I need to kind of, you know, visualize that to understand precisely what they're saying. And if it is staged, I don't know what the purpose of right. gripping a sapling would be in a staging event mm -hmm. or posing event. Uh, posing again is something different than staging. Um, I don't understand what the purpose of that would be. Again, you have to contextualize it with all of the other information that you glean at the scene. Um, uh, another thing, if you go back and you watch the video uh, the day, you know, and all of us have seen it where you have all the emergency vehicles that are out there at the scene where that vehicle was found. Um, it's raining cats and dogs that day. Uh, yeah. And I think the day that she would have gone missing was dry as a bone. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one of the things, because she was not found immediately adjacent to the road, that was emphasized. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, well, if the, if the ground was damp, there could be two things. You could have footprints, somebody carrying a heavy load. It's going right. to weigh them down more so than normal. Mm -hmm. And then you could have drag marks, um, dependent upon how they're treating the body. If she didn't ambulate out there herself, that's in, in case she didn't ambulate out there herself. Mm -hmm. If she was carried out there, then it's going to give a different impression. Um, but I don't know what the soil consistency was like the day before. Had it been, mm -hmm. you know, wet, this is an unimproved area. It looks like it's kind of muddy. It's forested. You've got pine needles out there, other leaves, debris. So you're going to come across mud. And how, how much care did they take when they 
egress toward the point where they found her. Because you go on a search, you're not thinking about where you're putting your foot. Okay, as you're stepping right. through these areas, you're looking for somebody. That's mm -hmm. the purpose. We want them to step wherever they have to step, the emergency workers. But, you know, when you go back and you try to measure it all, mm -hmm. um, did they step on any kind of vital evidence that might have given them an indication that this was not just her going out there? It was somebody else along with her. Um, was she barefoot? You know, I'd want to know where, where did she create or generate shoe prints going out there? It looks like when she walks into the family dollar, she shod. She has shoes on her feet. I don't know what they were, but right. she didn't walk in there barefooted. So that print obviously is going to look completely different than somebody that's shod that's walking, you know, into, you know, into the woods like that. Uh, and also you got a big problem if she's not wearing shoes, because again, that begs the question, why in the hell would she go out in the woods barefooted? You know, why, how did, how did she make it out there? Why would you choose to walk on uneven terrain that would probably really be painful to walk on? She's it got a, horrible. she's got a bad back that has been documented. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ingredients, you know, to, you know, to this equation. Uh, Inside, for one, any more questions? That you can yeah, see? yeah. There's a couple. I have one real quick first, um, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, sure. How many times have you seen suicide by somebody setting themselves on fire? Uh, I, three. I've I've had okay. three cases of self-immolation. Uh, it's rare. I mean, it is. As I say out in the country, it's rare as hen's teeth. It's just not something that you see on on a regular basis because it's such a horrendous way to die and i have to tell you all three people that i had were in a uh um they were going through a psychosis a psychotic break mm -hmm. um i think two of them were severe uh like really debilitated schizophrenics that were not medicated another person was uh just morbidly depressed um and was doing it to kind of make a statement, you know, and you go back, uh, anytime I think of self-immolation, I always think of, you know, the, that infamous uh, video slash picture from Vietnam where you have mm -hmm. the monk that's in the lotus position, pours right. the gas on himself and sets itself on fire. It's not something that you, you come across. It's, it's a rarity. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm amazed that I had three over the course of my career. Um, now, there's probably people that have had more. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, right. it's not something that happens a lot. Could she, could she have started to do it and changed her mind? You know, I mean, it's just, it's a, again, rhetorical question. It's just so hard to believe. Uh, Jean Panic and, and other people in chat want to know, what do you think of the message? Uh, they won't let me go. And the money, I, you know, what, what does your, your high tuned brain tell us about that? Oh my God, your <laughs> level of perception is a little bit off there. I do brain. Yeah, my frequency is kind of warped right now. No, no, uh, no. I don't know. It was uh, when when I first heard it, uh, mm -hmm. I heard the you know content of the thing. It was super bizarre. It almost sounded as though it sounded as though that it was done, you know, like under duress of of some sort. Mm -hmm. Um. But there was no indication of that. If you, again, back to the video from Family Dollar, does anybody believe, you know, when she was walking in, that she was under duress then? No. That she was, Not even um, close. you know, she, she wasn't fidgeting. She wasn't nervous looking, you know, because that I was talking to a friend of mine, the FBI agent, you know, and they were talking about kidnappings. And one of the things you look for, you know, uh, is this kind of heightened awareness that people have they're hyper vigilant you know because they're paranoid about things um and there was not that or if somebody's being followed uh mm -hmm. there was no indication of you know that kind of hyper vigilant thing going on she just seemed cool as a cucumber when she walked in. she didn't seem to distressed uh at, you know in any way of course you know i'm i'm analyzing a family dollar Right. video right now right. so I you know I, I don't know i don't know how valid that assessment is but you know that's all that we really have to work with but i mean it just you just use common sense 
You know, yeah, you can yeah. tell in someone's distress. She wasn't at all. Uh, no, I, and she didn't go screaming out of the parking lot. No. Either. It's not like she was burning rubber, you know, to get out of there or driving erratically when you watch that loop of the vehicle kind of exiting. You know, there was nothing. Right. There was and, nothing really that was, you know, and I didn't see any. And the one thing I was looking for is I was trying to see if there were vehicles that were mm-hmm. following her. Right. And, uh, you know, out of the parking lot. I, I didn't see any evidence of that. Of course, I don't know how much of the loop I, we we were all privy to see. I don't know how much more there may have been. Well, and um I just, I, 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 I don't even know what to say because I think every possible scenario that we've talked about tonight is absolutely logically possible. And remember in the beginning, the cops said that it, it was, uh, they're treating it like a homicide and they made it very clear. And then now it's like, eh, maybe not so much. Well, I got to tell you, that's, that's boilerplate police officer speak because, and I even teach that, I still teach at the academy. And the one thing that you, when you stand before that group of young officers and you tell and you teach them Mm -hmm. the working, you know, the working uh, premise going in is that all deaths are homicides until proven otherwise. So that's kind of the fallback position. You should treat all that because you only get one swing at it. You don't, you're not going to be able to go back and recapture. You can't unring the bell. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, that's one of the things that, that you look for. I, one final thing about, about this case, I'm not much, and maybe I'm sure as tuned in as, as everybody in web Sleuths is, um, maybe you guys have heard more, uh, but I would love to know what kind of, uh, evidence they were able to harvest out of the van specifically. And I, it hasn't been spoken of much, at least, you know, to uh, w- within my my hearing. I, it I hasn't. don't think it's been spoken and, much at all. And, and I think that that would be, I think that there would probably be something there, perhaps, mm-hmm. uh, if this was something odd that was going on. Um, you know, because uh, I have to say, you know, why that spot? why out of all the spots you could have chosen you chose that spot mm-hmm. uh, you know i'd want to know if the vehicle is mechanically sound um right. i haven't heard anybody say anything about that you know and that should be the first step you know or is is the vehicle operational you know mm-hmm. it was this a disabled you know event that took place and maybe it got out of hand maybe somebody stopped you know um, along the way and interacted with her mm-hmm. don't know Again, that information has not been released. It's just uh, absolutely crazy. Um, I, I have a couple more questions, but um, insightful one. Do we have any more from chat? Yes. Um, somebody had asked if anybody had heard if they talked about if she had a boyfriend. I have not heard that. I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that at all. No, I haven't either. Have... Not one single bit. Uh, anything else? From chat, I, I mean, it's just the thing is, it's like, I, it's so bizarre. I can't even, mm-hmm. I can't even put it together. None yeah. of it from from what we know. I mean, there, right, right. You know, as you know, all kinds of evidence that will make a lot more sense uh, when we know, if we ever know. But again, that uh, text she sent and the money she sent was close to what the boyfriend owed in fines. Right. She didn't like the boyfriend. Uh, I, I don't know. Did she start to do something and change her mind? Did somebody else start to do it and change their mind and run off? I, it's just so bizarre. I can't even begin to. to yeah, it is. And I, I, you know, I think the per. I mean, I feel terrible for the whole family and, you know, certainly her husband, I, you know, um, right. You know, the son though, that's kind of on the outside, um, mm-hmm. You know, looking in, I think that it's not on the outside in a negative way. I'm just saying he has some distance from this and he probably feels really out of control right now. Um, and uh, she seemed very close with him, you know, mama and her son, you right. know, and uh, there's a couple of, you know, very endearing photographs that she she had with him. Mm-hmm. So I think they probably had a pretty, pretty close relationship. And I don't know, that's just kind of struck me, you know, through throughout this thing. And Lots of times we forget about all of that. Well, I do as a forensics guy, sure. you know, and something, you know, you guys are more in tune to it than I am lots of times. 
Uh, but yeah, yeah, that, that's kind of uh, stayed with me. Um, I want to read a comment from uh, Melinda Rothblatt who says, after driving to the site, then the store and past the school, the spot doesn't make sense as you would have to drive down the highway a bit and turn around. Again, it just keeps making less and less sense the more we know. I, I can't even begin yeah. to, to put it together. Um, real quick, and uh, Joseph, I'm going to let you go because I know you're exhausted, but uh, just real quick, going back to Delphi, uh, it was quite a surprise that, uh, that that this happened. We were all expecting uh, Keegan and his father to be arrested uh, because they seemed to be the ones that, um, that were, were on the hot seat, but I fully believe that they are still involved in this, and I fully believe it had something to do with... Um, a porn of some sort, perhaps. Um, when you when you said uh, the difference between staging and posing, staging would, like you said, you you stage something to make it look like something else, like a John, uh, like a, a John Benet Ramsey. You know, it's staged to look like somebody came in and it was a killer mm -hmm. and blah blah blah. And and posing would be for what would satisfy the person. Uh, committing the crime, right? Yeah, and also it can be done for the purposes of shock value. I worked a series of homicides mm -hmm. early in my career in New Orleans where um, um, a guy was killing prostitutes up and down the I-10 corridor, I think ranging all the way from, I may have mentioned it on the show before, uh, but all the way from Jacksonville, Florida to uh, to Beaumont think mm -hmm. and he had made several stops in my jurisdiction and uh, every one of these women that he would kill uh, tires were involved he would find areas where old tires were and you if you've ever been around piles and piles of old tires you can't smell anything else that rubber That's that rubber so yeah. yeah and so when we would find these women um they would be in the position of, uh, and forgive me, I'm sure somebody in the audience will know, but the classic, you know, Leonardo da Vinci uh, pose, the anatomical right. man uh, with the arms extended and the legs spread. Mm -hmm. And they would have their underwear on, but it would be inside out. And of course, you couldn't yeah. smell the body. You would have to visually see it. And most of the time, particularly in South Louisiana, things go really quickly. And so mm -hmm. most of the time they'd be severely decomposed by the time we find it. So there's a shock value to that. And that is that is posing and there's a psychosexual connection to that. Um, and it's it's they're thinking on a different plane than somebody that's attempting to stage, uh, that's attempting to stage a, a um, say, for instance, a murder-suicide uh, case I covered. Uh, maybe you guys remember, I think it was just adjudicated back in May out of Virginia where the daughter went and killed her younger sister and her mother mm -hmm. and tried to make it look like a murder-suicide. She right. was actually convicted. Well, that was purpose to put the authorities off scent mm -hmm. at that point to make it look like something other than it was. That's a stage... Right. Okay. Um, it's not, you know, it's not opposing. Um, and, and just based on your, your past experience mm -hmm. with Richard Allen, so far there hasn't been anything major brought up where people have gone, oh yeah, oh yeah, he was really creepy. Is This no. doesn't surprise me. There's been comments about how he said uh, he was going to beat his, quoting, beat the shit out of his wife one night at a bar. And that, that's the worst thing that I've heard. Mm -hmm. Some Somebody that does something like this, if he is guilty, wouldn't there have been signs along the way for a long time? No, not necessarily. Really? Not, with, not with BTK. Oh, good uh, point. Yeah, right. right. Um, BTK, nobody knew. Yeah, I know, I know the guy that actually put the handcuffs on BTK. Oh, and, really? Uh, spent a lot of time, yeah, with Dennis mm -hmm. Rader. And... Um, yeah, I mean, he was weird, you know, he was, but, you know, he kind of assumed, you know, he was a deacon in his Lutheran church there in Wichita. Uh, he actually had a job as a, a zoning kind of guy. He had an undergraduate degree from Wichita, I think Wichita State, mm -hmm. uh, in criminal justice and was the guy that would like ride around. If you had garbage in your yard, your grass wasn't cut, right. you know, he, he, give you he could ticket. give you a ticket or whatever mm -hmm. it was. And of course that, 
that facilitated him kind of, you know, checking, checking the area out. Perfect cover for that. And you wouldn't think of him as being suspicious. Um, and, you know, I, I got to tell you guys, um, when Alan's name came up and then I began to kind of find out what, <clears throat> what he did for a living and, and there um, in Del, uh, Delphi, um, one of the things that was very interesting, I, I, I had, I'd never really given much thought before him regarding how much information um, uh, the local pharmacy has about you and about your peripherals. Like in a particularly in a small town for anybody that I have in the audience that's from a small town, mm -hmm. uh, if you're related to folks and that is literally the only pharmacy in town, you have to drive, I think it's four, 14.5 miles to get to Walmart. Mm -hmm. It's in another town. That is the only game in town. You're going to know who everybody's related to. If your mama's got cancer, she's got drugs uh, that you're having to pick up from her. They're going to know you. You might go to church together. You might be part of some kind of local civic group. And, you know, you have that level of, there's a real level of intimacy that goes on with that because you're talking about the most intimate of things that is, and he's pharmacy tech, you know, know a lot about people, you're going to know about their conditions and then to kind of pile things on top of it. He's like, from what I understand, he's been stated as being the nighttime manager. Mm -hmm. So if you go to a lot of the CVSs and places like this, I guess Walgreens and whatnot, they can actually do some, photography processing there in store. There's a big machine for those that still use 35 millimeter or whatever, you can turn it over to them and they can kind of spin these things out for you. And, or, or they're printing out digital photographs that you've kind of taken in, you know, left your card or whatever it is, they print it out for you and they give you a pack of these things. Well, that, that takes it to a whole nother level of intimacy, you know, where you're sitting there and you're flipping, you know, flipping through the photographs at night, you're there all by yourself. If he was the nighttime manager, I don't know what that means. So I don't know right. if that means, you know, pre COVID, if CBS was open 24 seven in Delphi, Indiana, I, I don't know. Maybe he was the nighttime manager up until the store closed at 11 at night. Maybe that's how they define nighttime manager, but mm -hmm. he had access to all of this stuff. And so that, you know, that kind of gives you another, level of creepiness to this, you know, kind of how they can peek, peek yeah. into your life. It's a very, very good point. And yeah, he could just be sitting there at night doing God knows what, looking at those pictures. Anything is possible. And, and, and like I said, unfortunately, I think we're going to be hearing about some pretty uh, horrific things to come. But Joseph Scott Morgan, the uh, podcast is called Body Bags. The links to where you can uh, find body bags it's in the description. You can find it, uh, iHeart, Spotify, Apple, all of that. And Joseph Scott Morgan, I can't thank you enough. You just let us know what you need and we are there for you, my dear. Okay. I'll tell you what, what? the night, the night that Debbie Collier's autopsy report comes out. Yeah. Or even if they have a press conference, if I'm available, Oh yes. give me a call. I will. <laughs> I want to know the answers. We can go over it all together and we'll try to pick through it. Hopefully I'll have an advanced copy of it so mm -hmm. I can kind of read through it. All of you guys can read through it, formulate some questions and, you know, we'll try to scratch our heads over it and see what we think about it at that time. I think if, if for no other purpose, it'll be a great learning. Uh, oh, I view all of this stuff yes. as a learning opportunity. So we, we might can learn something about that, you but I appreciate it. you guys giving me an opportunity to chat with you check out body bags please give me a review on apple once you listen Absolutely. to it and recommend it recommend it i need all the help i can get um, i'm one little forensic scientist out there trying to have a podcast and there's mm. i'm the only one out there i think so uh you know just uh, try to support my work relative Absolutely. to forensics and uh, i try to teach everybody with every episode so and you're wonderful at it joseph scott morgan thank you so much we'll talk soon okay Hi, right, guys. Y'all have a great okay. evening. Be safe. All right. You too now. Bye-bye. Yes, ma'am. Bye-bye. Bye. Wow. Okay. Coming up. Uh, thank you, Joseph Scott Morgan. My gosh, he is so fascinating. And I'm telling you, this is one of the best nights on this live stream. Why? Because it's all guests and very little me. And that is a beautiful thing. <laughs>
because up next we have uh, uh, Kristen uh, from uh, uh, Kristen Middleman from Othram Labs. Uh, her husband David they they run Othram Labs. This is the new cutting edge DNA lab that has been making some incredible matches and the stories that they have to tell from just the past five days are amazing but first i have to let my cat in because she's going to drive us all insane if i don't open this door so hang on and everybody in chat get ready because kristen is up next and she is going to blow your mind come on lilith good kitty Good kitty, good kitty. There you go. I know. I know. Okay. Here we go. All right. Kristen, it is so good to see you. Hi, thank you for having me. Of course, of course. And again, I am so impressed what Othram Labs has been doing. Just, I mean, this is just like in the past, you know, week or so. It is un. Believable. Now I'm going to um, put a link up. This is to the Web Sleuth uh, generic Authram Labs thread that we have, and all of the Authram information is there. I'm going to put this in chat, and I'll put it in the description. But uh, uh, let me get my list out because I I don't even know where to begin. I'll tell you what. Let's begin with this. Well, I'm getting the list out and trying to decide which one to go first. Tell us about Authram. Tell us about Authram Labs and what you do. Sure. Authram was purpose built in 2018, the end of 2018. We started running our first case in 2019 to identify victims and perpetrators from crime scenes. That's all we do. We don't do medical testing. We don't do consumer testing. There's nothing else you can get here at Authram. We have truly taken the most intractable forensic evidence out there, DNA that people have worked at multiple other places and couldn't get a profile and have merged it with the most advanced genomic testing out there. Um, all of you know my husband is brilliant. He was part of the first Human Genome Project, the Thousand Human Genome Project, and he helped set the standards for using this type of sequencing in medicine with NIST, and the FDA uses that kind of, those standards still today to decide whether or not someone can run a test and make a life or death decision for someone. And so we were there, a lot of us here at Authram were there um, building a lot of this DNA technology for medicine, building a lot of this DNA technology for consumer testing. And somewhere along the way, we realized that forensics um, could really benefit from people adopting the most advanced technology and tests out there to the actual forensic evidence. And so we did just that. We, we know the cases were solved with forensic genetic genealogy in the past. Um, and you, you heard of many cases solving here or there, but not every case that had DNA was solving, right? A lot mm -hmm. of cases were still completely intractable. And all of you know that DNA is consumable. Every time you run one of these tests, you destroy that DNA. Mm -hmm. That's your last chance to get justice for someone and often your last chance to even identify someone because there's not that much evidence left. And there's definitely not a lot of budgets left <laughs> for right. testing these unidentified remains. And so when you're running these tests on methods that may or may not work, you're actually hurting someone's chance of getting justice. You're hurting someone's chance of getting identified. And so we decided that we wanted to build a process that was robust, that was predictable, and that was scalable. And I think I've told you many times as I've come on here, and I know David has told you over the years, that we're looking forward to a day where all of these cold cases start to be solved using these types of DNA testing methods. And we went from solving a few cases a year to a few cases a month to a few cases a week. And now we're solving a few cases a day <laughs> and those will start to announce later. Um, but, you know, and there is a lag time between where we are today here in the lab and the number of leads we're returning back to detectives to the confirmations and the actual announcement. Mm -hmm. Some cases never announce at all. But um, yeah, we've had an incredible October. The last two weeks, um, I actually wrote down all the names because I want to name them all. Mm -hmm. um, it, we identified 12 different people. One was a perpetrator. 
um, 11 were victims or unidentified remains. And um, we were able to bring closure to so many families, answers that they very much needed. And um, we were able to, to help tell these people's stories again, help piece them back to their families. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, help bring justice to set two perpetrators actually in the last two weeks. One of them was a case we identified the victim a few months back in New York. Mm -hmm. um, his name was George Seitz. He was a um, World War I veteran and he was brutally murdered by his barber after a haircut. And um, that barber, Martin Moto, he actually confessed to the crime now and has been sentenced to 20 years in prison in New York City. And so this is one of the, it's actually the first uh, forensic genetic genealogy prosecution in the state of New York. Um, and um, he, he now is going to serve time for the crime that he committed and people know what actually happened to him. He he killed uh, George Seitz and buried him in his girlfriend's backyard. Why? And his girlfriend's so little funny. child. I don't know. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. His girlfriend's little child. She saw it from the window. And she oh, held man. that secret for decades. And eventually she she told law enforcement, I think there's a body in, in the backyard. And they went to look and they found the remains. And that's how... We actually got involved and were able to figure out what happened and help identify him, uh, who was the victim. And then it led to the actual arrest of Martin Moda and now his confession. Thank God. I mean, that, again, one of many stories. And let's start with, with one of them. This is um, the Lady of the Dunes. Okay. And I'm going to share the screen here while you, you talk about this, Kristen, and tell us about the Lady of the Dunes. Absolutely. So um, the Lady of the Dunes is the oldest homicide in the state of Massachusetts. And it, she was found on federal land, actually. So this is a federal case that we worked with um, the FBI. Mm -hmm. um, and we were able to take her remains. Her remains were exhumed three times over the last, um, um, gosh, I, I, it's almost half a century, but I don't remember the exact amount of years, but um, they were exhumed three different times and she, um, no one could get DNA from these bones. They were really badly damaged. Um, mm -hmm. And when we got the bones, we actually realized that they were really hard to get DNA from as well um, and, and figured out during our quality control process that they were treated in formaldehyde. Formaldehyde actually cross-links the DNA and makes it very difficult for you to be able to read out that sequence correctly. Okay. Um, but we were able to figure out how to do it, and we were able to create a profile that uploaded to these genealogical databases, and we were able to identify um, the Lady of the Dunes as Ruth Marie Terry. And I know you know that there are so many theories behind what happened to her. She was found brutally murdered. Her hands were missing. Her head was almost severed from her body. Um, it was it was a horrific crime in, in a very remote area. There were theories that she was maybe an extra in the movie Jaws. Um, mm -hmm. There were theories that she, she was killed by a disciple of Tony Costa. There were, there were just so many theories because the MO matched perfectly to, to Tony Costa's MO, mm -hmm. uh, but nobody had any answers. And now we know, well, at least we know now that she was from Tennessee uh, what brought her to, Mas um, to Provincetown is still unknown, and there's investigations ongoing to figure out what happened, how she got there, and um, maybe piece together what happened the last few days of her life and identify her perpetrator. But um, we know that she was a mom. She was a wife. Um, she was someone's daughter and someone's sister. Her right. family is, is very, very appreciative. Um, to have finally figured out what happened to her. Um, they do ask for discretion as they process this news and, and people try to figure out what actually happened. But um, at least she has her name back. And, and I, I see the oh, picture. Oh. Of She's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And okay. So, and yeah, everybody be sure and go to dnasolves.com. We'll put that in the description as well. Let me put it in chat right now, because this is where you can look at all of these cases and you can donate to help find, uh, to, to help uh, 
identify these people because it costs money, uh, Kristen, right? It costs at least $5,000 for each case. And um, you, you do a lot of it because the police don't have the money. Families don't have the money. So a lot of it depends on donations. So you just go to DNA Solves and you can pick your case, right? Am I, am I getting this correct? I hope. Um, yes, there, there are cases that don't have funding listed on DNA Solves all the time. And we add new stories every time that the campaigns are funded. Um, it's absolutely true. Funding is one of the biggest barriers to actually solving these cases. Um, mm -hmm. There's just not enough out there for this advanced type of DNA testing. And so we do crowdfund. Um, I, I come and do interviews. David's part of interviews, TV shows, whatever we can do, as long as we can pay it forward to another case so that people can get the answers they need. Um, you know, waiting half a century to find out what happened to your loved one is torturous. And all the family members that I've met all of this time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, their life stops right there. They're seeking right. those answers every single day. It's mm -hmm. not something they can just walk away from. They often live in the same house. They often keep the same phone number, trying and hoping that someone will tell them what happened or give them a clue. And um, there's technology out here today that works. And it works robustly and predictably. Right. Um, and this so takes money. Yeah, and I think we're getting thing. we're getting there. The federal government is starting to fund more and more of these cases. Mm -hmm. um, next year, there'll be more funding for this type of testing. And as as the technology, you know, showcases what's possible, then I think that eventually this kind of testing will become a tool that law enforcement can use in every one of their investigations mm -hmm. that has mm -hmm. DNA. Okay, we're going to uh, look at a case now. This is Columbia PD partners with Authram to identify the suspect in a 1984 rape and attempted murder of a young woman. Tell us about this one, Kristen. Yeah, this is a horrible case. So um, the young woman was walking to work at 8 p.m. and on March 24th, 1984, and she was picked up um, in a car and driven to a cul-de-sac um, where she was brutally raped and stabbed. Um, her throat was, was slit and she was left to die. Wow. And um, so we identified James Frederick Wilson as mm -hmm. the perpetrator um, for that attack. And um, he has now been arrested and his victim actually survived. Um, this is one of our first announced cases where the victim actually survived the attack mm -hmm. uh, and this case means a lot to me because i can't imagine waiting since 1984 to find out that a perpetrator is going to finally have to face uh, the consequences of what he's done right. and um, i i am so honored to be part of a team that's able to to do that for somebody that's able to to make sure that people have to be accountable for their actions and that there is real justice for, for the crimes they're committing. And um, this suspect, uh, has he been named or has he just been identified and, and they're working on, on the rest of it now? His name is James Frederick Wilson. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, that, again, that is something that is, uh, like you said, so so special that you were able to do. And it's getting, it's what's so cool is it's getting more and more frequent. It's, you know, just one after, like, like we're doing tonight, one after the other, after the other. So uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. And let's see. Oh, here we go. Let me uh, share this case right here. This is a, a really interesting one because of who this person is. I'm, I'm surprised. Let's see here. And this is um, a homicide victim, but he, it, it looks like, was he in the sheriff's office or? No, he was, an, I believe he was, which one is this? Hold on. Can you, can you scroll yeah. down? Is oh. this, uh, yes, this, he was, um, sorry, he, this is Everett Gay Travis and he was actually an Air Force vet from Texas that moved okay. to um, Arkansas and then, um, I think 
who was 26 years old at the mm -hmm. time of his death. What had happened is that he um, picked up a hitchhiker. He picked up a hitchhiker named Kenneth Daring, and he wanted to talk to him about God and and help help him. He was a good Samaritan and the kind of person that always helped others, according to his family. Yeah. Um, so we were able to identify these remains. And when law enforcement reached out, when we worked with SEMO University and law enforcement on this case, and when law enforcement reached out um, to the family, his brother actually said, we've absolutely been looking for him uh, for all this time. And, and he told him the story where he picked up this hitchhiker and um, he was never seen again. This mm -hmm. hitchhiker actually tried to sell his car later on and got caught because the person he tried to sell the car to actually thought something was off about the whole transaction. And law enforcement found um, some of um, Mr. Travis's belongings in the vehicle. And um, so he actually got arrested for the crime and he served time in jail and actually died in jail. Mm -hmm. um, but he never told them where the body was or where he had um, committed the crime. And the family was never able to, to give um, That's him just burial. Bad. That's just, oh, what an evil, evil beast. Well, how did, so how did you come up, how, how did this happen? So the bones were, were identified just randomly by a hunter um, mm -hmm. in 1981. And so the hunter found these bones and then these bones went through several different types of testing and ended up um, being some of the remains that SEMO University Anthropology was working on. And they recommended that Othram possibly test these remains to see if we can identify who this person is. And then when we did the genealogical profile and uploaded it it matched to um his it matched to his family led us to his brother the investigators contacted his brother and his brother told the entire rest of the story so we were able to piece together both of those stories and um and figure out exactly what happened to him his remains were returned home his family was able to have a funeral for him and now they have a place to go visit him and, and everybody i want to stress uh, these are just like recent. These are one after the other after the other that Othram Labs has been able to do to help these families bring their loved ones home and to help find the perpetrators as well. So if you go to dnasolves.com, you can pick your case and donate to that case. But we, oh, hang on, people. We have more. Okay. And again, <laughs> this, this, this isn't just like, oh, the year 2022. No, this is like from the last week. Okay. <laughs> And here we go. We're going to do three here, okay? Um, Once, this yeah. is three homicide victims identified. Um, so, whoops, hold on one second. Sorry. Let me uh, stop sharing here and then let me do this. Sorry. I've got to, still don't know how to do this in a this Wait. one's cool. This this is a cool story because Benton County Sheriff's Office. This was th these were the first three cases they ever sent to Othram, mm -hmm. and so um, these three cases are obviously all uh, different. They're different time frames. They're different mm -hmm. victims, different circumstances, um, and we were able to get profiles and identifications um, and and provide back the investigative leads to those detectives um, in a pretty timely manner, so timely that by the time that they confirmed the identifications, it was easier to do an announcement for all three at the same time oh, rather than do the individual cases. I do believe that it's 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 a once in the first time it's ever happened that right. there's been three cases announced at once from one law enforcement agency. Um, boom, boom, boom. But it shows you the power, like I said, of this technology. It shows you that when done right, and um, and done in a way that the DNA is is uniquely treated for each piece of DNA from mm -hmm. each case um, to do what's best for it, then you're able to get these identifications um, relatively quickly and you're able to clear entire backlogs. I can't imagine, um, you know, that we wouldn't be able to clear most of the law enforcement agencies' backlogs out there if mm -hmm. we were given the chance. So our first person here is 33-year-old um, uh, Fred James Grow, 
better known to his family and friends as Jamie. And then we have uh, John Douglas Rawlings Jr. And after 32 years, the victim of a 1990 cold case homicide has finally been identified as 28-year-old Donna Sue, is it Nelton? Yes. So um, yeah, Jamie or or Fred James Grow, he... um, he, now he's an active investigation. What we found out after we were able to identify him is that he was planning a trip to Kansas City, with Wichita, and then he was supposed to go on to see family in Colorado. Um, he never made it to see family in Colorado. Many people actually saw two women um, pack the car with him to go to Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Um, they had asked him for a ride to Oregon but he said that he would take them part of the way to Kansas City, Wichita and drop them off there. Um, People have now given the descriptions of these two women, some information about where they had said they were from and where they were going. Um, You can find it on the DNA Solves link. If Mm -hmm. any of you have any information um, on the whereabouts of those women or anything else related to this case, um, there's a number on there for you guys to call but this is now an active homicide that, that is being pursued by, um, by the sheriff's office there. Um, as far as Donna, that's, that's actually a, a, a super interesting story as well, but, but the ending, the actual what happened to her was, was something that um, law enforcement was able to piece together as soon as we were able to, to make this identity. So Donna Sue um, Nelton was found in 1990 she mm-hmm. was last seen in the fall of 1989 um, by her family members, and they told law enforcement that she was seen with her boyfriend, George Burton. Um, George Burton was a terrible, terrible man, mm-hmm. from what I've read. Oh, he had held um, two families hostage. He had wounded multiple officers in Utah. He um, was part of or connected to several murders in Kansas City. He was part of a bur- um burglary and a robbery, a bank robbery. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was actually on parole in 1988. And he was really quickly back under suspicion in 1989. So I guess yeah. when he was out on parole is when um, he murdered Donna Sue Nelton. While he was back in, under suspicion, they found some of her belongings mm-hmm. um, with him and they found her car. Um, in one of his storage units or something. And he actually confessed to killing a Donna. He didn't say her whole name. Mm-hmm. And he said that he killed her because she was threatening to reveal his drug and theft operations. And um, they, he actually said he left her body in, in one of his properties in Missouri. Law enforcement searched for four days and were not able to uh, um, find her remains. Mm -hmm. And and as you know, her remains were not found in Missouri. They were found in a remote area of Arkansas. And um, when we were able to identify her, though, and her family did put her together with this person, they were able to put both the stories together. And so now her family not only knows where she is and where her remains are, but they know what happened to her. And as awful and tragic as that is, that's got to fill you with uh, just a lot of relief knowing that you are able to provide this information to the family so they don't have to keep living this nightmare of not knowing, you know? Absolutely. I feel like as tragic as some of these stories are, they're reality. And the yes. truth is always better than no answer. Exactly. And, you know, to continue to seek those answers every single day mm-hmm. is really difficult. At least now they know. They know. And can you tell us what happened to John Douglas Rollins Jr.? Yeah, he was 31 years old. We were um, his remains were found near uh, Beaver Lake, Arkansas, Mm -hmm. and um, we we were able to identify uh, his family. Law enforcement reached out to his parent, who said that yes, their son was missing since 1990. Um, I think the last time he was seen by family was in 1995, which is very close to when the remains were found. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was obviously a homicide victim as well. And there's an active investigation um, as to what might have happened the last few days of his life as well right now. Okay. Again, 
this is just uh, one, you know, one state, just one after the other after the other. And they were so close together that you were able to, um, uh, you know, do them all at once. Oh, but hold on, people. There's more. Are you kidding? There's more. I, this is just amazing. I, I, not surprising, really, because of all the work that you do and how, how hard you work and how dedicated you and Dave and everybody at Authorum Labs. I just, I just adore you people. You are wonderful. Let me get this screen share here and let's see. D, 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 D. There we go. Okay, here we go. This is our final one for the night. Yes, we finally did come to an end, but damn, what an end. So, okay, please go right ahead. This is Othram, uh, the Office of the State Medical Examiner of this. Is this Mississippi, I take it? It is. This is Carla Davis again. She's our philanthropist in the state of Mississippi. Um, you guys know Carla as our chief genetic genealogist here at Othram. She has also funded the entire initiative to, to try to um, name every unidentified remain that has DNA in the state wow. of Mississippi by herself. What and a wonderful um, woman. Um, yeah, by, from the very, very beginning of this project, um, we've been able to make a ton of impact in that state, and we've been able to show what can really happen when funding is unlocked in a certain area. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, William Leach is, is one of the, the um, remains that that Carla has helped name, not only by funding it, but also by doing the genealogy herself. Mm -hmm. um, he was um, 47 years old at the time of his death, and he was from Panama City, Florida. How he ended up in Mississippi still remains a mystery, and um, the investigators have asked for any tips to be sent um, to them. And so the story still hasn't unfolded for, for William Leach and, and we hope to find out. Um, and I'll tell you that over the last, the seven days before all of the cases that we mentioned just now, um, we named Doreen Tiedman, Cynthia Gunnerson, Ronald Rosek, Stephen Gabbard, who actually was a witness in a RICO trial, and then he got murdered while he was pending to be the witness. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a crazy story. And then again, we had um, Patricia Campbell and then all the stories that we talked about today. So 12 different identifications in less than half a month. That is amazing. And a conviction. I mean, that's pretty incredible. That's incredible. And you know what? It is incredible, but it doesn't surprise me because of your dedication and how hard you all work. And you can tell this is your, this comes from your heart. I mean, when we have you and Dave on, there's no question. That, um, you can see David working right there. He's still on the oh, way. I'm on the other side there. He's, he's still on his desk right behind me there. Him? With Raven, yeah. Um, <laughs> 7am. We, we don't leave. Um, we, we, really do live at the office and we really do care immensely and there's a huge difference between wanting to solve a case so okay. you can be part of a story and and feel important and actually doing what's right for a case exactly one first principle at Othram and that is do what's right for the case mm -hmm. that may mean that Othram doesn't test that evidence that may mean that we don't collect money from law enforcement. Right. Um, that may mean that we put it on hold because the science isn't there today. But unless you can truly build technology that is predictable, that you can before you consume the evidence and before you consume budgets and, and even more so than that, people's faith in the technology mm -hmm. uh, by throwing it on there and getting no answer, it's mm -hmm. so important to know. When you go to the doctor and the doctor treats you, you expect that the doctor knows that that treatment is going to help you in some way. Right. And not, certainly it won't harm you. Right. You went to the doctor and they gave you a pill and they said, well, it's a 50-50. You, you may live and you may die after this pill. Would you take it? No. Mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. what's happening with this evidence. They throw it on assays with no predictability, with mm -hmm. no real understanding of the properties of that DNA. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it's destroyed. And the evidence is destroyed. Exactly. And, and that's, there you go. That's the difference. You, you, you do what's right for the case, not necessarily what's right for your company and your visibility. You do what's right for the case. And that is 
so important and again so very very rare okay everybody you have got to go to dnasolves.com again i'm going to put the the link is actually in the description but i'm going to put a link to all of these cases so you can read about them and also i'll put the link to our web sleuths discussion on authoring but uh, we would like to know is there any update on the case that we helped fund uh the man from north carolina that was found he weighed like 120 pounds and he was six two and and uh any any updates yeah so um well, I, I have to wait for law enforcement to announce the updates before I can announce oh, them. Okay, sure, uh, absolutely. I will tell you that um, the case is progressing, and I'm so uber grateful, and I can't wait to come on here and tell you the results as soon as we know them. Oh, yay, okay. Well, wave back to Dave for us, and you know you are welcome here anytime, and way to kick ass, man. This is just and it's, again, not surprising because I know how hard you guys work, but I am just thrilled. And I think this is just going to keep uh, building and building. And pretty soon we will be able to identify everybody. So thank you so much. And, and if you can pick a case, people, and donate to it, that would be great. Again, it's dnasolves.com. We'll put it all in the description. Kristen, thank you so much. You have made our night. This is so, this is great news. Great. Oh, thank you so much for always supporting us. And if there's always. anything we can do for you, we're always here. Thank you, my dear. You take care. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye. Wow. I mean, really, I just like this, just boom, 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 just one after the other, after the other. I, 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 it's unbelievable. Right. Well, yeah. No, it's not unbelievable because if look at, look at their passion. I mean, their passion is amazing. So real quick, I missed one of the super chats and I'm so sorry. I had Carol. Thank you, Carol, so much. And Jody Farr. And there was somebody in the middle and I went to write it down and it disappeared. I am so sorry. Does anybody remember? If anybody does, uh, yeah. put it in chat, please. So I can say hi. Uh, Jean Panic, can't DNA be copied or duplicated? Yes, it can, but it's not that simple. Um, it uh, sometimes can and can't. And it's just... Uh, it's really, really complicated. And that's why uh, Kristen and Dave are like scientists, like they're brainiacs, like they're brilliant, you know, stuff like that. Oh, I'm sorry, Marlene Clausen. I did not get to ask your question. I do apologize. We will get to it next time, though, I promise. And Susan B., thank you so much for the donation. I really do appreciate it. And if anybody in chat can tell me who that super chat was from, oh my gosh, I feel so bad. Well, PB and J says, "Wow, don't mention my super chat. I'm just glad to be here." So, oh, I'm PB. thinking it was PB and J. PB and J, thank you. So, I want to mention your super chat. That was so nice of you. I went to write it down because my eyes are so because I'm so flipping old. I'm like, who was it? And then, boom, it went away. Drone man, thank you so much. Another super sticker from you. Again, greatly appreciated. And you know, PB&J, I love you. You are a sweetheart. So hang on here really quickly. And I want to thank, hold on, uh, Trisha S. Thank you very, very, very much, my dear. And Mary M., you're a doll. And Nancy G., can't thank you enough. Tracy R., Julie K., the gang. Karen K., uh, Melody, yeah, Melody R., again, Oh, actually, that was from yesterday, but that's okay. I'll say I'll say thank you twice. And hold on, I just want to check one other thing. <laughs> and thank you, Detective's daughter. You are a sweetheart, as well as uh, Sherry W. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. You guys saved my life this week. I'm telling you, you totally saved my life. I, I can't can't even thank you enough. Okay, so what have I missed in chat? Have I missed anything exciting, thrilling, or uh, anything going down I should know about here? Any gossip? No, no gossip. We just okay. have a lot of smart people in there. We do. We do. <laughs> yeah. Hey, there. Let me tell you. I, it's either going to be this upcoming Sunday or next Sunday. We are going to do a very special. Uh, web Sluice YouTube Live. It's going to be featuring all of our merchandise from Vox, House of Vox in France. And uh, I have merchandise coming and it'll either get here Friday 
which means we can do it on Sunday, or it'll get here Monday, which means we'll have to wait till next uh, uh, Sunday. What is that? The 11th? I don't know. I don't 12th, 13th. Anyway, so just depending on when it arrives. So be aware of that. It's going to be a fun show. We're going to have all kinds of merchandise to show you. I'm going to be dressed up in Web Sleuth merchandise, and you're going to see how much fun we will have. And of course, we'll talk about true crime. Okay. And if you have Web Sleuth merchandise, we want to see it. Send us a picture. We'll be putting that information up as well. As soon as we know what date it is for sure, either this Sunday or next Sunday. Okay. What have I forgotten? Insightful one. It's your job to remind me of everything in my life. <laughs> um, I can't think um, our show tomorrow. Uh, oh yes. Yeah. Tomorrow. We are going to have a wonderful man on uh, an actor who I think will help us understand how people become like how they behave in a cult like manner, like how you look at somebody and they're believing what somebody is saying. And you're like, how can, how, how can you believe that it's such a lie? And he was in Scientology, but he gave the most impassioned speech that I have heard about how a, uh, somebody getting involved with a cult can happen to anybody Never think that it can't happen to you. An insightful one. Oh my God, I can't believe I don't have his name in front of me. Do you? Doug Scott Kramer. Doug Scott Kramer. Thank you. Um, he was on uh, uh, a recent YouTube channel and I was so impressed with what he had to say. I think it's really, it, we are going to be able to use his understanding and his explanation of how people that we know that are believing bad YouTubers, you know, bad actors, when the evidence is right in front of them. And it's all about cult thinking. And you are you are going to be fascinated by him. Trust me on this. So yeah, it's going to be a great show tomorrow night. And who knows what we'll find out about Delphi. Again, people, I think we need to prepare ourselves. It's going to be really ugly. It's going to be some pretty awful stuff. And I have a feeling it's going to just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, uh, it's just appalling when you think of it. So uh, I agree. Our hearts and love goes out to, to Abby and Libby's family. Uh, and they, anything they need, they know. We'll, we'll do anything that they, that they would want us to. So, okay, everybody. I love you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Insightful One, for saving me again. And Ping the Router, I'm so glad you made it. Love and Coco, thank you, thank you, thank you. Moonlight View, you're the best. And everybody in chat, thanks for the thumbs up and, uh, you know, share share the love, share the link, share the WebSource YouTube live channel. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow night. Okay. Bye-bye. Good night.